there was the cybernetic conspiracy, which is a book so confusing that nobody seems to know what it's about. Though, by the way, it was written by an academic, a computer scientist. With a considerable reputation. Yes. So shows you how easy it is. I, I've actually seen that book. I, I remember that book. And I remember, just like this Amazon reviewer, which was not me, I'm just saying I was parallel to this, I couldn't figure out what the hell he was talking about. And over in astrology, we've got destiny cybernetics and astrology. And uh, even allusions to the cybernetics of sex and love. Of course, it was the 70s. But it gets even wilder with uh, the cybernetic ESP breakthrough, which sort of combines literally ESP and mind development. A darker one, and one which continues to this day, though, is this one. This is, a, uh, I think this book is less than five years old. There are a number of dark conspiracy theories out there in which our field plays a significant role. Most particularly, the uh, storied MK Ultra mind control work from the CIA in the 50s. So there are a number of alternative histories of cybernetics to be found out there in these dark books claiming that cybernetics is in fact the cobble that set up everything that's wrong with the world. Never could find images to prove those. I'm particularly fond of diet cybernetics for lean lines and uh, applied cybernetics atomic energies of the mind. By the time this had run its course, Norbert Wiener was already dead. Had he not been dead, he would have wanted his freaking word back. So what happened after that? Taking yet another abrupt turn, I wanted to move on from the idea that cybernetics somehow became tainted, watered down, somehow lost its focus, at least in terms of popular recognition and so forth, and try to steer back more toward what happened after that and how does this have to do with interpersonal communication or listening and so forth. Heinz made up for the cybernetics title by establishing the BCL, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and that's really what happened. Uh, the establishment of the BCL would provide a nexus for research for quite a considerable length of time, and it's still the research that most of us refer to, adhere to, were inspired by today. I recommend the Muller's book to find out more about the BCL and what went on there. One particular theme that came up, and one of the earliest things they did was yet another conference. The Symposium on Self-Organization, 1961, which was one, uh, cell, a study of self-organization and self-organizing systems. The themes that came up there would continue throughout the BCL's history and would set the stage for what we now call second-order cybernetics. There were two Nobel Prize winners at that conference. Yep. Roger Sperry and Uh, yeah, I'm not sure which is which. Uh, Hayek has the glasses there with the bow tie, and Sperry is somewhere over here. I'm not sure which one. Might be that one back there. In the meantime, there were people doing work. There were people going back, you might say, to the roots of the coalescence of cybernetics. You know, systems, particularly mechanical systems, particular uh, not so much mechanical by now, but electronic and so forth that were hacking with ideas and in turn were generating ideas based on results which had to do with circularity and the themes of uh, cybernetics, most particularly with regard to communication. On those rare occasions, such as February 1960, when the press paid attention to them, they would also occasionally mug for the camera. <laughs> for some reason, it seemed to be of significance to the reporter by the way, the, this, the article from which this is extracted is available online in, in its entirety as images if you want to go find it. For some reason, the reporter seemed particularly interested in the fact that Gordon at that time was smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. In fact, there's another image of him sitting there staring off as if engrossed in thought and puffing away. That's all I wanted to talk about. First, there was Musicolor, which was an adaptive light controlling device for entertainment purposes really but which could essentially learn 
and adapt and even get bored with the operator. This led to a more general interest in the idea that these tactics of adaptation, of learning and so forth might be used in training systems. The early training systems led to theorization as to what had been learned from their invention, deployment, and use. And that led to a general conversation theory uh, in the 70s. And toward the end, sort of another level of abstraction moving on to the so-called interaction of actors theory. This is basically, I ripped off Paul, so I ripped off some of his illustrations. The main point here is that at least as of the time of the general conversation theory, PASC was uh, recharacterizing interaction in terms of behaviors, interactions themselves, what was going on. Not in terms of symbols or semantics somehow being conveyed or passed between the conversants, but how they were behaving, what they were doing, and that the object or measure of merit of the interaction could be uh, assessed in terms of apparent agreement or correspondence. In the training context, these themes had to do with the notion of a, con a concept, which might be a particular behavior or loop or, or something in and of itself. That in the training context, the idea of conversation was not conveying something meaningful from teacher to student, but rather sort of a resonance or correlation correspondence between behaviors to a point that the student seemed to have it. The point was the student seems to have something, not it. It was not the issue. Then we get to Maturana. I'm going to make this fairly quick, which is unusual for me. One aspect of Maturana's theory of the living organization, relevant here with regard to communication and so forth, is that the nervous system is operationally closed and has what I call the Las Vegas effect. What happens in the nervous system stays in the nervous system. There is no ephemeral information or meaning or stuff moving in or out. More to the point, the notion of conversation or interaction, linguistic interactions, proceeds from the biology that reciprocal structural coupling between the conversants who have operationally closed nervous systems can result in perturbations. I know I'm using big words and this is all very blurry, but stick with me. Can result in perturbations that affect each participant's orientation within their cognitive domain, within the sphere or realm of interactions within the operationally closed nervous system, hopefully leading to a mutual orientation or correlation of behavior or apparent behaviors. This kind of dynamic model for what's going on is what Maturana calls languaging. And the correlated orientations within the cognitive domains of the participants is the point in terms of what an observer would call the semantics or the communication that is going on. Either of the participants may in fact be operating as that third party observer in parallel. But the third party observer is making up the whole notion that there's anything transferring between them, that there is any necessary or impelling effect such that one participant says something, the other participant must necessarily go along with it. That's all a fabrication of the observer. But it can also be a fabrication of one of the participants in their parallel role as such an observer. So another way to phrase it is that it's an interbrading of experience and not any kind of semantic transfer at all, or communication as we usually talk about it in the engineering sense. So by the time we get here, between Gordon and Humberto, communicative interactions are all about the interactivity. It's not about meaning or anything like that. The behavior is circular, cyclical, recursive. It's a process, matter of an agreement or mutual orientation. That is the measure of merit, not transfer of something meaningful 